okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the general topic of my presentation will be using just-in-time compilers in modern browsers to inject arbitrary co code fragments uh, on the fly for later using it co for code reuse attacks. More specifically, uh, 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 so just-in-time compiler is a process of creating native code out of a higher level language that is JavaScript in our case. JIT compiler is using by all modern browsers to improve the performance of uh, JavaScript code. However, JIT compilation also creates some uh, security threats for browsers. Namely, uh, JIT compilers must make sure that no attacker control data from the JavaScript can end up in the native code after compilation. So there have been already several uh, attack techniques that illustrated how this can be done. However, uh, modern browsers already defend against this type of attacks. In this presentation, I will show yet another way how we are able to emit arbitrary three-byte gadgets. Uh, and also, we will consider modern defense, code reuse defenses, such as non-readable code, to do so. In the end, I will also introduce defense techniques that will help JIT comp compilers to defend against our proposed technique. So before I go into details, I will quickly overview uh, code reuse attacks. So basic code reuse attack, uh, as name suggests, uh, attacker reuses already existing code from executable and imported libraries. For example, in the following setup of the memory, attacker first identifies all the gadgets that, uh, he, and function pointers that he needs for code reuse attack. Gadgets are small sequence of assembly instructions, usually and ending with the return instruction. Return instruction helps attacker to chain multiple of these gadgets together. Having all these gadgets, the attacker then overrides the stack to chain multiple gadgets together and also provide uh, parameters for gadgets and functions. And finally, it diverts the control flow to the first gadget of the gadget chain, triggering the execution. So basic assumption of uh, basic code reuse uh, attack is that attacker must know the addresses of these gadgets in advance. The most widely used defense technique against uh, basic code reuse is address space layout randomization, or simply ASLR. ASLR randomizes the base addresses of the code, and by doing so, forbids the attacker to know the addresses of the gadgets in advance. However, ASLR has major limitation, namely that leaking even a single pointer from the code reveals all the information and addresses from the neighboring gadgets. This has been fixed by introducing fine-grained uh, code randomization, which randomizes the code inside memory segments. Thus, attacker cannot know, by leaking a pointer, cannot know uh, information about neighboring segments. However, all fine-grained code randomization have been shown to be ineffective against dynamic code reuse attack. For example, in JTROP, attacker uses memory disclosure vulnerability multiple times from JavaScript to acquire arbitrary memory reads. Having arbitrary memory reads, attacker then does pointer chasing to leak as many code pointers as possible, and then follows these code pointers to read code pages and find gadgets and function pointers on the fly. Having all the gadgets ready, the attackers then change them together and divert the control flow to trigger execution of the gadget chain. The main strength of JTROP is that attacker uh, can uh, leak uh, addresses of the gadgets and function pointers after they have been already randomized. To fix this issue, several researchers propose similar defense techniques which deal with this problem. I will call this new class of defense XNR as in executable and non-readable. And also, as name suggests, XNR, the main principle behind XNR is to mark code pages as non-readable. And also to forbid attacker to guess or compute the addresses of gadgets, XNR further randomizes the code and also hides code pointers. By doing so, XNR successfully defends against JTROP and by forbidding the attacker to execute the first step of the JTROP that is finding the gadget. However, is reading the code necessary for successful code reuse attacks? 
As it seems and as it was demonstrated by JITSpring, it's not necessary. For example, in JITSpring, attacker uses predictable code output of JavaScript compilers and uh, sprays its own code in the executable portions of the memory. For example, as it is shown on the figure, attacker can create a huge JavaScript function which contains lots of integer constants. After compilation, these integer constants will end up as part of assembly instructions, namely immediate fields of assembly instructions. And diverting the co control flow to any of these constants will execute arbitrary uh, code that attacker puts there. For example, in our example, uh, this uh, spread code is an op sled, which is uh, a long sequence of NOP instructions, usually followed by a shell code. Creating large enough NOP sled will help uh, attacker to guess uh, code pages more easily. However, JSPRAYING attacks doesn't work anymore in modern browsers because they employ a uh, few defense techniques. For example, Internet Explorer and Chrome use constant blinding. That is, instead of, for example, if uh, in, in, in our example this integer constant is uh, controlled by the attacker, instead of directly moving it to the target register, it uh, first moves integer constant XOR with a random key to the register, and then to restore the original value, it emits another XOR instruction. Therefore, target register is set to the correct value, but attacker doesn't have the ability to uh, spray the code by providing integer constants. Another defense technique that is used by inter Internet Explorer only is NOP insertion, and it further diversifies the code. Uh, we will later see this implication of our, in our uh, attack technique. However, there is a limitation in constant blinding. That is, because of performance reasons, only constants that are larger than two bytes are diversified, are blinded. This limitation was used by the authors, or author, authors of the paper, the devil is in the constants. In this paper, authors realized that it's not necessary to encode return instruction as part of their integer constant. Instead, what they did was uh, encode the required two-byte instruction sequence as part of return statement in JavaScript, and then diverting the control flow to this two-byte constant will execute the required instruction. And after following the regular control flows, an epilogue would be executing, uh, executed and final the re return instruction. And if epilogue doesn't break the execution, as it was the case in Firefox and Internet Explorer, the attacker gets arbitrary two byte length uh, gadgets, excluding the return instruction. However, there are a few limitations with this technique. First, that it requires readable code. And we cannot, it's not usable in our context when we assume XNR defenses, that is, code segments of the memory are not readable. Another limitation is aligned return instructions. In this attack, attackers use aligned return instructions. Therefore, if there is some control flow integrity checks between two byte gadget and return instruction, this attack technique will fail. In the second part of this presentation, I will now introduce how attacker is able to emit three byte gadgets. And in this attack technique, I will assume that XNR code, uh, XNR is applied to the code sections of the memory, therefore we cannot read it. And as a threat model, I will assume that uh, we have arbitrary memory read. So all previous uh, attack techniques concentrated on embedded fields to inject arbitrary values in JIT compiled code. Consequently, constant blinding is also applied only on embedded values. However, in our work, we will focus more on the displacement field. Displacement field in x86 instruction is used in address computation and stores an offset from some base address register. Some types of uh, displacement fields in x86 instructions are uh, instructions accessing memory and control flow instructions. We will be using control flow instructions in our technique. Control, examples of control flow instructions are conditional jumps and direct calls. First, we start with, a, with easier case, that is conditional jumps to emit attacker controlled values. The simplest case to get conditional jump after JIT compilation is to use JavaScript if statement. For example, as it is shown in the figure, 
if we have the following if statement in JavaScript, after compilation, it will give the conditional jump. Depending on the condition, if condition of the conditional jump is true, it will jump over the body of compiled if statement. This means attacker can change the value encoded in displacement field by varying the size of uh, post-compiled size of uh, if statement's body. And what makes it easy for the attacker to change, precisely change the size of uh, post-compiled if statements body is that in JIT compilers, all JavaScript statements have predetermined si uh, sequence of assembly instruction in which they are compiled. Therefore, attacker knows in advance the number of bytes that is required to compile each JavaScript statement. So for conditional jumps to emit gadgets, the attacker has to create if statement uh, whose body size after compilation equals to the value of the gadget. In our second approach of emitting gadgets, we use direct calls. Displacement in direct calls encodes uh, distance between the callee, that is a function that we are calling, and the caller instru call instruction. Therefore, to control the value encoded in displacement, we have to, precise, we have to put our call instruction at precise location from the callee. However, this is not easy because we do not know in advance where our function will be compiled. However, we can create uh, large functions that contains many enough uh, displacement fields in many enough uh, direct calls that it will cover all possible three byte displacements and all possible three byte distances from the uh, callee. For example, in the case, in the figure, we use the instruction i equals i plus j in Chrome. This instruction is compiled into 16 bytes. And if we use this instruction 100,000 hex times, it will be compiled into 1 million hex bytes. And this will emit all possible 3 byte displacements. However, the least significant half byte of all these displacements will be set to the fixed value. Uh, however, we can also adjust this fixed value by prepending the JavaScript function with uh, other JavaScript statements. For example, our current fixed value is 5, and to emit system call gadget, for example, we need to add additional five, uh, 8 bytes to, to 5. This means if we use i equals 1 JavaScript statement at the beginning, this will give us system call and also all possible 3 byte gadgets that uh, end with a hex digit D. After emitting all these gadgets, we have to find them. However, we do not, uh, we cannot read code because we assume uh, code segments are non-readable. However, there are a few places from data segments where we can leak function pointers. These places are compilers heap or return addresses from the stack or, for example, reading JavaScript objects and leaking code pointers from them. And knowing the address of our function and address of the callee function, it's easy to, gen, uh, to compute the address of emitted gadgets. Having the basic concepts ready, we will now discuss their applicability in modern browsers. I will start by showing how to emit uh, the following set of gadgets in Chrome. So in this uh, set of gadgets, we set argument register for a system call, and then we execute the system call. We start by emitting system call uh, using direct calls in Chrome. So as we already described, the first step is to align least significant half byte of displacements to hex digit D. And then we will uh, allocate enough uh, direct calls to cover 1 million hex bytes. Note that this doesn't only give us system call gadget, but all possible three byte gadgets with uh, the same hex digit. And also, this will cover pop RCX and pop RDX gadgets, which are two byte gadgets. To emit remaining three byte gadgets, we use conditional jumps. And we use stacked if statements in JavaScript to emit pop R8 and pop R9. As pop R8 is uh, the value of pop R8 uh, gadget is smaller than pop R9, inner if statements body will be compiled to that value. And to reach from popper 8 to popper 9, we add additional 100 hex bytes. And this will give us uh, both of these uh, gadgets. Gadget generation in Chrome took 
around 1.3 seconds. However, there are some limitations uh, in Internet Explorer, which doesn't allow us to image these gadgets easily. For example, Internet Explorer limits the size of a compiled uh, JavaScript function. And uh, JavaScript function, function code size limitation directly limits us uh, with maximum value of displacement fields that we can encode in conditional jump because conditional jumps can only be made inside uh, the same function. However, we can still use uh, direct calls because uh, direct calls encode the distance between two functions and not, is not limited by function size. However, we are still limited with uh, our previous technique where we wanted to spray a large enough code. We are not allowed to do so. And uh, further, NOP insertion also diversifies uh, the displacement field emitted by direct calls and we have to deal with it also. So our plan to emit uh, gadgets in Internet Explorer takes the following steps. We first get the correct code page at correct distance uh, from the colleague. Then we fill the page with gadget emitting functions. And finally, we check if direct call emits correct distance, correct displacement, and if not, we recompile the function. So the first step is the following. We uh, compile enough function to get 100 code pages in Internet Explorer. Out of these code pages, we choose the one that is at the correct distance from the colleague that is mass random in our case. And correct distance means that a third byte of the displacement will call, uh, contain C3 byte, which is the return instruction. Having correct code page, what we do first is we deallocate it to make space for uh, gadget emitting functions. Then we fill up the space so that next gadget emitting functions that we want to compile will be compiled at the correct place. This will set another hex digit in the displacement field. Next, we compile our gadget emitting function which uh, contains a statement that is called to mass random which emits direct call. And displacement field of this direct call will have all the bytes set except for the last one. This least significant half byte of this displacement is randomized by NOP insertion. Therefore, we, we don't know the value what it contains. To know the value uh, encoded in displacement, we leak return address put there by direct call. We verify if this is at the correct place. If not, if it is at the correct place, it means that we have found the gadget. Otherwise, we decompile the function and go back to step three. Step three will recompile the function again. Now displacement field will also be randomized and we do so until we find the correct gadget. So we tried this technique in Internet Explorer 11 and our, we aim to emit POP A and system call gadget. This is because Internet Explorer by default uses 32-bit JavaScript compiler. So the first two steps of gadget generation took around eight seconds and the third step of recompiling Cisco uh, took around two seconds. But this took two seconds per each iteration. So on average, gadget generation in Internet Explorer took around 32 seconds. So to sum up our attack technique, we demonstrated two ways how we can emit arbitrary three-byte gadgets in modern browsers. We use conditional jumps, which works in Firefox and Chrome, but it doesn't work in Internet Explorer because of code size limitation. Another technique is direct calls. It works in Chrome and Firefox. However, it doesn't work against uh, Firefox because Firefox doesn't use direct calls after JIT compilation. The final part of my talk is about how to prevent this gadget emission attack in JIT compiled code. The main, main idea of this defense will be to uh, get rid, to take away uh, the leverage from uh, attacker. That is, we convert all the relative addresses into absolute ones. That means attacker cannot control uh, the values encoded in them anymore. We st uh, start by direct calls. So we distinguish between two cases. The first case, if we know the absolute address of direct call, in this case, we simply move this absolute address into a scratch register and execute an indirect call. 
The second case is when we know only the relative address of destination. In this case, we have to compute absolute address on the fly at runtime. To do this, we use LIA instruction and add relative address to the instruction pointer. However, now this LIA instruction emits this relative address, which we wanted to hide in the first place. To get rid of this relative address, we split it into two, as it, as it was done already in constant blinding. The first part will add relative address ended with a random key to the instruction pointer, and second part with, will add the remaining bits, that is, relative address ended with the inverse of a key. The second part of the defense is converting from conditional jumps to safer conditional jumps. The first part, what we do is uh, change from direct jumps into indirect ones. We do this similarly as we did for direct calls. However, there is a problem that we do not have indirect conditional jumps in x86. Therefore, in this case, uh, statements inside the if body will never be executed. To fix this issue, we add additional conditional jump at the beginning. This conditional jump will have the inverse condition as, as original jump had. That's because if body was executed in original case where uh, only in the case where original condition was false. We implemented our defense in V8 and to measure the performance overhead, we used V8's JavaScript benchmark suite. On average, it showed 2% performance overhead and However, it showed 26% code size overhead after generation. However, this 26% equals to around 300 kilobytes for the entire benchmark suite, which is still tolerable. We additionally used micro benchmarks to test for worst cases. In micro benchmarks, we used 1 million direct calls and conditional jumps. And uh, the performance decrease was 14% and 10% on average. So to summarize, in this presentation, I have shown that, that displacement fields can also contain attacker-controlled values. And to make sure that generated code is not influenced by the attacker, JIT compilers have also have to get rid of them. We also demonstrated that we don't need readable code and predictable code output from JIT compilers is enough to leak the addresses of emitted uh, gadgets. And finally, we showed how to remove uh, gadgets from the displacement fields by converting relative addressing into uh, direct, indirect one. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thanks, Georgie, for the presentation. And there's the first question. Hello. Um, is it on? It's on. OK. My name's uh, Pierre. I'm from UC Irvine. Uh, I worked on one of the JIT ROB defenses. You might know this. Yep. Uh, and I, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, the assumption was always that code pointer hiding would be uh, applied uniformly. And it looks like in your paper, you're assuming that it's not applied to the JIT compiled code, which it wasn't in our prototype. And yes. we, we don't think there's any limitations or reasons why we wouldn't do that. We simply ran out of time before we had to submit the paper. Um, oh. Would you agree with that, that your attack would no longer work if, if code pointer hiding was applied uniformly? Uh, so there was no implemented code pointer hiding in JIT code. It was mentioned that this can be extended to also protect JIT code. However, right. uh, however, this defense technique was using trampolines to, for code point, pointer hiding. And in our case, when we also encode gadgets in direct calls, trampolines will now contain all these possible gadgets. So, uh, for example, if we again emit this 100,000 direct calls, now these direct calls will also be in compiled code and in the trampolines. Well, and the the compiled if we don't get code pointers, this will be defended. But we know addresses of trampolines, and all we need to know is uh, somehow leak address of uh, call destination. If everything is hidden, this will be defended. 
but if there is still some code pointer missing in not complete implementation, then our attack will right, still work. That's kind of a circular argument, right? If there's a code pointer not protected, then there's a problem. Yeah, and another issue is that I think, uh, I mean, we, we do not try to uh, propose some better defense. We, uh, we, uh, so what we wanted to show is that it's important to get rid of gadgets from displacement. But for example, in, when you hide all code pointers, there are also side channels that can be used. For example, when we use conditional jumps, it, we created really huge functions. And depending on the, uh, allocation from compilers, we could somehow know where this function was allocated. And there, after that, because of predictable code output from JIT compiler, we know direct offset where um, our gadget is. In that case, we have indirect leak without code pointer of our function, mm -hmm. and then we have all the gadgets inside conditional jumps, which might still be doable, but it uh, sort of uses some side channels. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for speaking again. Thanks.